Hello everybody. I hope you guys had a wonderful and very relaxing spring break. It is time to return to the physics. So today we're going to talk about electricity. Um, this video starts our unit on um, electricity and circuits and it will take us over the next couple of weeks, probably until almost the tax test. Uh, but we're going to start with our discussion on forces the electric forces. Now we've talked about a couple of forces before, mainly gravitational forces and the applied force, uh, moving things back and forth, up and down. Um, electric forces are a little bit different, uh, but I think you're going to find that they are in some ways very similar. So before we can talk about electric forces, let's have a little discussion about static electricity. Almost all of us have experienced static electricity. We've all gotten that shock before. Um, but I want you guys to think about what are some examples of ways that you have experienced static electricity. And I want you to think about um, what needed to happen in order for you to experience that shock or to uh, feel your hair kind of stand up on end. Uh, this little girl, of course, is experiencing a very dramatic example of static electricity uh, by using what's called the Van de Graaff generator, which is what one of these things are. Um, and we will do that in class. Now, granted, mine doesn't work that well, so your hair is not going to look like this. But uh, you will experience static electricity through that um, on Monday. So whenever we have this static electricity happening, um, we get that shock or we see our hair stand up. It's because objects are electrically charged. And there are two different kinds of charges that objects can have, positive and negative. Um, positive from the protons, negativity from the electrons. Y'all probably got all of that in chemistry. So like charges will repel each other and opposite charges attract one another. So if you have two positives, they are not going to want to come together. They are going to want to push apart. If you have a positive and a negative charge, they are going to want to come together. They will attract one another. Uh, this is just like opposite ends of a magnet, right? The north and the south poles, they are attracted to each other, but try to put two norths together and they're going to repel. And I have this picture here. If y'all, y'all are probably too young to know, but Paula Abdul came out with a song called Opposites Attract. Back in the 90s, back in my day, uh, and this was a picture from the video. She had this weird little animated cat in the video with her. Kind of didn't make any sense, but it was cool at the time. All right, so let's talk about balloons a little bit because y'all have probably, uh, or you've seen a teacher do this experiment or demonstration before. When you rub a balloon in somebody's hair, um, it makes that person's hair kind of stand up in a big fro looking way. Uh, so what's happening in that case is that when the balloon is rubbed on somebody's hair, you are moving charges from one object to another. Now because of the way that atoms are uh, situated, we have our, uh, center point here, our nucleus, this is where all of our protons live, and then on the outside, this is where all of our electrons live, right? So the electrons are the ones that are free to move around. The electrons can go from uh, object to object or molecule to molecule. It's the protons and the neutrons that kind of stay put in the center. So whenever you're rubbing a balloon on somebody's hair, what's happening is that that person's hair is giving the balloon extra electrons. There are electrons moving from the hair to the balloon. So um, our balloon then becomes negative, and then the person's hair becomes positive. Now we just learned in the last slide that like charges will repel each other. So if all of this person's hair has a positive charge on it, every one of those strands is not going to want to lay flat, right? They are going to want to stick up because they want to be as far away from each other as possible. So those positive charges are going to repel. Uh, this is a drawing. I know this looks like something I would draw, but I did not draw this. I found this on the internet. It looks terrible, but it gets the point across. So before this whole uh, interaction occurs, we have a balloon, which is overall neutral. It's got equal positive and negative, and we have the person's hair, who is overall neutral, equal positive and negatives. Rub the balloon in the hair. Balloon is going to scoop up extra electrons that are sitting on top of the person's hair, and now person has all positive or an overall positive charge. Now mind you he still has or she still has electrons um, in her hair but just she has more positive than negative at this point. And this is an example of static electricity. 
So we're going to talk about two different kinds of materials. We have insulators and conductors. Conductors are materials where the charges move freely through them. I want you guys to think of what would be a good conductor of electricity. And then I want you all to think about what would be good examples of insulators, things where the charges do not move very freely through them. Um, and we will talk about that a little bit more in detail on Monday. So we are going to focus on three ways it is possible to charge an object. How are we going to transfer uh, electrons from one object to another? We have three different ways. Um, the first way is by contact, which is a uh, pretty straightforward method. It involves two objects actually coming in contact with one another. These are just a few examples. The balloon in the hair, one I just talked about. Or um, you can have a contact charge by walking across a carpet. If you guys have ever put on socks and scuffed your feet across the carpet, your socks are going to pick up extra electrons from the carpet, which is why uh, when you touch a doorknob or when you touch the TV after you walk across the living room, you're going to get a shock because those extra electrons are leaving your body and going into the next object that you touched. Um, so for contact to happen, two objects have to touch each other and they have to actually physically transfer charges from one object to another. So the electrons have to leave the balloon and go to the hair. The electrons have to leave the carpet and go to you. So this kind of method of charging occurs in conductors and insulators, not just uh, in one or the other. So two things coming in contact with one another produces charging by contact. All right, the next one is a little bit trickier to explain because not very many people have really experienced it, but um, it's called charging by induction. This only happens in conductors. Uh, you can't really charge something, you can't induce a charge on an insulator. It just doesn't happen like that. So um, how you do this is uh, you are going to bring a conductor near, ooh, if I can underline correctly, near another charged object. The difference between method one, which is contact, and this one, is that these objects don't ever actually touch. So I have a kind of like a step-by-step uh, -step down here of what's happening in this kind of method of charging. So you have, let's say this is a metal object, a metal sphere, let's say, and for reasons that I don't quite know, we want to put a positive charge on this sphere. So, for whatever reason, we needed to have positive charge. So we can do this by induction. If I take a, an overall negative object, let's say it looks like a metal rod here, and I bring that negative rod just close to this metal sphere, what's going to happen is that you're going to start to get what's called a separation of charges. Because opposites attract, all of the positives in the sphere will get closer over here to the negative end and all of the negatives will try to get as far away as possible from this negative rod. They don't like each other. So uh, once we do this and once we establish what we what I call a separation of charges where you have positives on one side negatives on the other, um, you can do what's called a grounding. Uh, some of you guys that are maybe in DE or principles of engineering maybe have heard of this before and you've even done it. <coughs> um, people that work on computers and things like that, they constantly have to be grounded uh, because they need, uh, they need to make sure that there's no extra electrons on their body. Static electricity is really bad for your computer, FYI. So if your computer sits on a carpeted floor, you probably want to work out some way to pick it up off the carpeted floor, either put it on a box or, I don't know, put it on your physics book if you're not using it for anything else. But you need to make sure it's not on the carpet. All of that static electricity that the carpet will, con will uh, conduct can fry your motherboard if some weird way your computer gets subjected to those extra electrons in the carpet. So. A little safety tip for today. But anyways, you can ground this metal sphere, which really essentially, honestly, is just plugging it into the earth in a weird kind of way. You just take a wire and you attach it to um, the sphere, and then you attach the other end of the wire either into another object, or you can attach it to uh, the earth itself, the ground itself. It's really just giving all of these extra negatives a place to go. They're already separated. They don't want to be close to this, this negative rod here, but if you give them a way to get even further away from this guy, they're going to take it. So if I attach a wire to this metal sphere and put that wire or whatever it is into the earth, 
those negative charges are going to take that opportunity and go even further away from this guy here. So, in picture D, you can see you have a negative rod. Now you have a positively charged metal sphere with all of those extra negative charges in, in the ground and the table and whatever it is that you put it into. And then you can take away your negatively charged rod and bada bing bada boom, you have your positively charged sphere. Ta-da! Uh, that took a really long time to explain, but in practice it really doesn't take that long to do. Maybe a second, maybe, like maybe a minute, 30 seconds maybe. Alright, the last way that we're going to learn how to charge something, and it's kind of a misnomer because we're not really charging per se, uh, but is by polarization, and polarization only happens in insulating material. So, in an insulator, uh, when you have polarization, what you're happening is you're having uh, a separation of charges. You're having that uh, split between positive and negative. So let's say, for example, I took my balloon and I rubbed it in somebody's hair and I got it all charged up negatively, uh, like it did by contact, right? So if I bring that now negatively charged balloon close to an insulator, what's going to happen is that the molecules in the insulator, this is a piece of wood according to this example, um, the molecules in the insulator are going to separate. The positive charges are going to rearrange themselves so that they're closer to the balloon, and then the negative charges are going to rearrange themselves so that they are farther away. Now I'm going to do this little demonstration for you guys on Monday so you all can see this if you've never um, seen this before. But when the charges separate like this, uh, you can have an attraction between the balloon and the object. So in this case, the balloon would stick on the wood. Um, it's important to note for polarization is that no charge transfer is happening in polarization. The balloon is not giving charges to the wood. The wood is not acquiring, the wood is still neutral. The wood has not accepted any extra charges from the balloon or lost any charges at all. It's really just a rearrangement of the charges that are already there. Alright, so whenever we have two charged objects uh, that are coming close to one another, they're either going to move away or they're going to want to move towards each other. So that tells us that there is a force that's acting on those two charged objects to either bring them towards or away from each other. So. The larger the two charges are, the greater the force is between them. This is very similar to our gravitational force. And the equation that we use for it is very similar to gravitational force as well. So how do you think the distance will affect the force between two charges? Let's look at our equation and figure it out. So um, this is the math part. And this equation is called Coulomb's Law. Coulomb was a guy who did a whole bunch of work with electricity back in like the 1800s. Um, and he found out that the electric force between two charges is equal to K, which is what's called Coulomb's constant. You know you've made it in science when you have a constant named after you. So Coulomb's constant times Q1 times Q2 divided by R squared. So what do all these letters mean? K, like I already said, is Coulomb's constant. It is equal to 8.99 times 10 to the ninth. But because uh, that is too silly to write, we are just going to use 9 times 10 to the ninth for all of our math. It makes it a little bit easier, and it even gives you the opportunity to try to do powers of 10 in your head, like I encouraged all of you guys to do before. Um, Q1 is the first charge, Q2 is the second charge, R, I didn't put it on here, is uh, stands for the radius, but it's really just the distance between the charges, so I'm going to say R is the distance between charges. Charges are measured in what's called a Coulomb, capital C, the unit for electric charge. So, uh, we're going to do a quick little math practice together. Um, let me pull up my whiteboard here. I don't have a particular example. I'm just kind of going to make this up flying by the seat of my pants here. Uh, so let's first write our Coulomb's law equation. And this, like I said before, is very similar to our... Uh, gravitational force equation. If you guys remember, our gravitational force equation, equation was g times m1 m2 over r squared. So pretty much the exact same mathematical process, it's just this is gravity and this is electricity and the constants are different. 
So, uh, kind of an important number to know, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to do this super fast, um, is the charges on an electron and the charges on a proton. They, in your book, meaning they, in your book, people, um, they ask you guys questions about the charges between electrons and protons, but they don't actually ever tell you what that is. That's kind of like one of those values they expect you all to know. But for a proton, it's 1.67 times 10 to the ni negative 19th um, coulombs, C. And this is for a proton. And then for an electron, uh, since these guys have equal and opposite charges, it's just negative 1.67 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs for an electron. All right. So um, I'm going to give you guys a quick practice problem since this is primarily just plug and chug. So um, I want you guys to figure out uh, what is the electric force between uh, an electron and a proton when And they are, let's say, one millimeter apart. All right, so we have our K value, which is 9 times 10 to the ninth. We have our charges for uh, Q1, which is going to be our electron, and Q2, which is our proton, because I just gave them to you guys up here. And then our distance, or our R value, is going to be 1 times 10 to the negative third, because that's one millimeter. Now, don't forget, probably the biggest mistake kids do with this equation, because it is pretty easy. It's honestly just plug and chug. The numbers are kind of big and kind of weird looking, but it's not too bad. Um, they always forget this squared, so be very mindful not to forget it. This equation is on your star chart, um, and so, you know, when I give you guys a star chart, if I do, or if I write it on the board, always just double check. I mean, the equation is there for you, so don't forget that squared sign. And I'm going to stop there, and I hope you guys had an awesome break, like I said, and I will see you all on Monday.